it's much more fun to be in person, you know, than, you know, talking through a bunch of uh, rectangular boxes that we have been doing over the last uh, few years. So uh, thanks for uh, this opportunity. Uh, so in, in this, this talk, talk, I, I want, want to give an, an overview of the uh, research that me and uh, my co-authors and also other people uh, have been doing over the last uh, few uh, years about uh, using uh, machine learning tools to improve uh, classical linear algebraic task algorithms like uh, low rank approximation. Right? So in a way, on a very high level, uh, the spirit of this talk is similar to the uh, previous talk, right? in the sense that uh, uh, th this talk is also focused on how can we use classical methods and uh, augment them or uh, train them uh, in some way using uh, modern machine learning tools to improve the uh, empirical performance, while hopefully at the same time retaining some guarantees. Okay? Uh, the domains are, of course, very different. Right? It's not computer vision, it's a linear algebra, but uh, like the overall spirit uh, of the approach is uh, similar. All right. Uh, so what is the class of uh, uh, algorithms that uh, 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 you know, we'll try to uh, improve using machine learning. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad uh, class, uh, which, uh, 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 well, it, it goes under several names, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to refer to this class as uh, uh, algorithms that use uh, linear sketches, but uh, as you see in a moment, you can also call them uh, linear measurements or, or, or some other uh, terminology. So the class of algorithms that I'll focus on, which is uh, surprisingly broad, is uh, uh, essentially encompassed by the following uh, three steps here. Okay, so you have some input, uh, which is uh, a vector or a matrix or, or something linear algebraic. Okay, and uh, what uh, those self sketching methods do is uh, in the first step, they take the input and uh, uh, heat it with some uh, uh, matrix S. Uh, I will refer to this uh, matrix as a sketch matrix, but uh, uh, you know another name is a measurement matrix, right? And uh, there are also other uh, other names. No matter what the names are, uh, the goal uh, of uh, this uh, compression here is to reduce the dimension of the vector, right? So this is a dimensionality reduction step. X uh, is uh, larger than S of X, okay? And uh, once the algorithm performs this uh, compression, then uh, uh, the rest of the computation is uh, performed on the sketched version as opposed to the original version. Okay? And uh, as you can imagine, the reason for doing it uh, are, are numerous. You know, uh, for one, if uh, uh, S times X is uh, shorter than X, then operating on the sketch version can be much more efficient. Right? So you can save space, time, you, know, you can use it in various architectures that you couldn't use otherwise, and so on. All right, so what are the examples of uh, uh, this uh, uh, approach uh, to algorithm design? Uh, uh, you know, the prototypical example is uh, a compress sensing, right, which I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, most, if not all of you, uh, have seen it uh, before, right? So this is a classic picture of a, a single pixel camera uh, developed in a Baraniuk and Kelly group uh, at Rice University. All right, so, the, you know, the, the essence of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, camera is that uh, instead of, uh, you know, we have an image, instead of sensing this image pixel by pixel, uh, which uh, would require either lots of uh, sensors, right, or a long time to scan, you know, instead, uh, you, uh, this uh, device, you know, uh, computes a projection of this uh, vector uh, describing the image with, uh, or computes a dot product of this uh, image Right with uh, some pattern, a pseudo-random pattern, and then uh, this uh, value of this product is being sensed by a single sensor. Okay, so uh, this makes it possible to acquire the image using, you know, in this particular case, only a single sensor. And if you do it several times, you are going to get several uh, uh, measurements of the image using those uh, random. Uh, uh, vectors, and uh, from the relatively few number of measurements, uh, compress sensing uh, theory in practice shows you can recover X. Okay, so this is uh, uh, one, perhaps uh, the most well-known uh, example of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, class of algorithms. There are others. Uh, so, uh, uh, in the particular compressed sensing, at least part of the theory is based on the uh, random dimensional reduction uh, theorem due to Johnson-Lindershaus. Uh, 
right? Which essentially says that if you have a bunch of uh, points in a high dimensional space, you can uh, hit them with a random uh, uh, matrix S, reduce dimension while preserve the distance uh, properties, right, of this uh, input. And uh, uh, compressed sensing is one application of uh, uh, dem or, uh, aspects of compressed sensing uh, are one application of dimension reduction. Uh, there are others, like for example, nearest neighbor search or, or other uh, uh, algorithms which are also used on this method. Uh, and there are many other areas, right? Like I work a lot on streaming algorithms. Uh, the algorithms that use very little space, right? And the reason why they use very little space is because uh, the whole input is uh, compressed. Right, so that uh, you don't have to store the whole input, and uh, and so on and so on. Uh, for today, we'll just uh, we'll focus on uh, uh, one particular class of uh, uh, algorithms, which are algorithms for linear algebra, uh, and in particular for problems like regression and uh, low rank approximation. Right. So as we'll see over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, there have been uh, lots of uh, developments in fast approximate uh, algorithms for uh, these problems. And uh, most uh, of those uh, algorithms uh, use uh, sketching as a, a key component. Okay, So uh, in the rest of this talk, I will give an overview uh, of this uh, class of algorithms. And uh, then I will describe you know, how we can uh, use machine learning to improve upon this algorithm, in particular, how to learn uh, these uh, matrices S. Right to improve the performance uh, of uh, of those methods. All right. All right. So uh, uh, I kind of said it already, but uh, uh, you know I'm just gonna repeat again. So in vast majority of of, uh, of these applications, the matrix S is chosen at random. Right? There are various uh, uh, distributions to choose it from, and they are not all equivalent. Right? You could use uh, independent Gaussians, you know, random partial Fourier, random sparse. Right? But random partial Fourier or random sparse matrices gives you higher efficiency. Right? So the choice of the uh, distributions from which you select those uh, matrices matter. Uh, however, in uh, uh, you know, all of these applications I mentioned, those matrices are almost always random. And there are reasons for it. Right? Uh, random matrices are super useful. Uh, for one, uh, you can easily store them, you can multiply uh, your data by them, right? so, so, so they are very efficient. Uh, and uh, uh, equally importantly, you have uh, worst case guarantees. Right? So you, you know that uh, if you hit your data with a random matrix, right, you have theorems that tell you how much information you lose. Okay, so you, you know that you are not doing some, something uh, uh, you know, ad hoc, right? You actually have a tail bounds on the, uh, on the probability uh, of uh, error. Uh, so this is the good news, and this is the reason why they have been so uh, popular. Uh, but there are also cons, right? And the main con is that a random matrix, by definition, doesn't adapt to data. Right, because you know, it just doesn't look at the data at all. Right, you just generate your Gaussian and uh, without uh, uh, paying attention to what you apply this uh, uh, Gaussian matrix to. So, the natural question is, uh, you know, in the uh, applications that uh, uh, I mentioned, you know, can't we just uh, use this uh, uh, sketch or projection matrix from from the data? Okay, with the idea that uh, in that case uh, we can actually tailor uh, that matrix to uh, to the data distribution, right, and hopefully uh, improve the uh, reduce the error. And of course, oh yes. Just to clarify, are you talking about like looking at a broad data set and creating one S from that broad data set that you can use later, or are you yes. talking about calculating S on the fly as you? gather information about the data you're observing. I see. Uh, uh, so I will define the, the full model uh, in the next slide. But uh, in short, the answer is the, the first one, right? Yeah, so we'll, uh, um, you know, we can think that there are lots of many instances. And I will look at all of them, uh, come up with some matrix S, which is good for those instances, right? And then use the, this uh, S you know, from now on. Yeah. And uh, it's a very good question. I will make it uh, more clear in the, in the next slide. Yeah. All right, so, uh, you know, of course, uh, this uh, idea is not new, right? In fact, one of the earliest uh, techniques for dimensional reduction, PCA, that, that's exactly what it does, right? You know, have a bunch of points, and you, uh, based on those points, you try to find the projection, right, which uh, uh, is, you know, maximally adapted uh, to those points. Uh, so the idea is not new. Uh, uh, however, in many of the applications I mentioned earlier, 
uh, this uh, idea of uh, uh, learning or training the projection matrix, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has been introduced uh, relatively recently. Okay? So, uh, in particular, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and uh, please correct me uh, if, uh, if I'm wrong, right? But uh, to the best of my knowledge in the uh, area of compressed sensing, uh, this uh, idea uh, first appeared in a, a very elegant paper by Ali Musavi, uh, Patel, and uh, Rich Baraniuk uh, from 2015. And uh, the essence of uh, uh, their paper is a very nice, uh, uh, I would say interpretation or implementation of compressed sensing uh, uh, in the language of a uh, so-called uh, autoencoders. Uh, how many people are familiar with autoencoders? Okay, so maybe half, right. So uh, the details don't matter. In particular, this picture has uh, way too many details and uh, you probably cannot see them anyway because uh, the font is small. Uh, the basic idea of the autoencoder is a, uh, you know, let's say neural network. Uh, which is uh, given an uh, input, uh, some, some vector x, right, on the right side. And then uh, this uh, information flows uh, through a bottleneck, like a low dimensional bottleneck. Uh, and at the end, this network is supposed to reconstruct uh, this uh, input on the left side. Okay? And uh, so you uh, train uh, this neural network by uh, presenting it with many inputs and trying to uh, tune the weights so that uh, the error between the input and, and output is uh, minimized. Right? And after you train those weights, you, know, you can view it as a, some form of a compression. Right? Because uh, you know, if you uh, feed it with the input, right, then uh, this bottleneck, the information this bottleneck is the only thing you need to recover approximation of the, of the output. Okay? So, uh, so in particular, uh, if the sun network on the right hand, right hand side, okay, is uh, just a, a single layer which only performs a, a matrix vector product, right? Then this is essentially a matrix S, right? And uh, you can uh, train the entries. You know, the entries of that matrix become weights uh, of the neural network on the side, and then you can jointly train the encoding, the matrix S, as well as the, the decoder uh, on the left-hand side, uh, so that uh, you, you perform uh, uh, reconstruction from linear projections. Okay, so this was uh, this was a very uh, insightful and uh, influential paper, and uh, it made several people, including myself, uh, think about you know like whether one can apply a similar way of thinking to other problems that are use this uh, random sketching matrices. And uh, uh, in this talk, I will focus on application of this uh, uh, you know approach, right, of uh, learning matrices. Uh, from uh, examples uh, to uh, problems in linear algebra. All right, now, uh, linear algebra, you know, of course, it's a, a huge field, okay? So in this talk, I will just focus on uh, one particular problem, which is uh, a low rank approximation. I'm, I'm sure that everybody here knows what a uh, low approximation is and, and why it is useful. So here, this is just to set up notation, right? We we'll use A to denote the, uh, the matrix. And, uh, you know, SVD decomposes it, uh, you know, into, uh, uh, you know, this, this type of representation. Uh, uh, in many applications, you know, people truncate these applications only to uh, the top uh, singular values. Uh, you know, so here top, you know, you know we, 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 K denotes the, the number of singular values that uh, uh, we want to approximate uh, this matrix with. And uh, one interpretation of uh, uh, this matrix here is that uh, it minimizes over all uh, rank B, rank K matrices at uh, the Frobenius distance to the original matrix. Okay? So this is the uh, error, uh, approximation error that uh, we occur uh, if we truncate this uh, representation uh, to, uh, if restricted to only top K uh, singular values. Okay? So nothing new here, this is just the definition. All right, so of course this is a, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, uh, uh, overstate how important this problem is. And uh, lots of uh, very efficient algorithms, libraries, implementation have been, uh, have been done. Uh, still, you know, this problem does not have a linear time solution. 
right? Uh, you know, uh, typically, to best of my knowledge, uh, the algorithms used, you know, let's say for matrices n by n, uh, running time and cube, right? You can get it a little bit faster using, say, Strassen method, right? Uh, but uh, uh, this is often too large in many applications, especially when the matrices are sparse, right? So, uh, because of that, uh, especially over the last uh, 15 years or so, people developed uh, lots of approximate uh, algorithms for this problem. And here the approximation is with respect to the Frobenius error, right? So instead of getting the optimal matrix, uh, uh, you know, the algorithm that uh, uh, people developed, you know, give you error, which is one plus epsilon times the optimal error, right? So this uh, epsilon times this uh, tail, is the cost of using those faster uh, algorithms, right? And there is, of course, a trade-off between the approximation and the running time. And, of course, the reason people are doing it is because uh, uh, you can solve this problem uh, for reasonable value of epsilon more efficiently than uh, computing the exact decomposition. And uh, starting from the work of uh, Sarloch, uh, Liberty, uh, uh, in the mid odds. Uh, lots of such uh, algorithms uh, have been developed. Uh, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, like state the results because it's actually a big field right now. Uh, there is a very nice uh, survey by David Woodruff, which, uh, 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 you know, gives a very nice overview uh, of uh, the state of the art uh, in this uh, area. But uh, just uh, to, 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 to give an example, uh, you know, for, uh, natural values of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, parameter k, uh, you can compute uh, such an approximation in time which is uh, linear in the number of non-zeros of the matrix, right? So this is something which is uh, uh, particularly good uh, if your matrix is uh, relatively sparse, right? So, and if you want to learn more about it, you know, this is a very good uh, uh, introduction. All right, and uh, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, most of these algorithms are using uh, this uh, sketching approach. You know, the you know the first thing they do, uh, and sometimes the second and the third, is uh, uh, you know to hit the input matrix with the sketching matrix, right, and then perform the computation over the the sketch, right. So this is one of the sources for their uh, efficiency. And uh, for efficiency reason, uh, these matrices are uh, typically either partial Fourier, right? So we can compute this projection using uh, FFT, or, uh, uh, you know, they are sparse. In this talk, I'll focus on sparse matrices, right? So, you know, very sparse matrices, you know, which still preserve the, the important information uh, about the matrix after the projection. All right, so, um, so this is the, the type of algorithms that uh, will try to merge or refine using machine learning uh, methods, okay? And b before I get uh, to, how to how to do it, let me just uh, give an example of an algorithm. So this is the algorithm that we'll uh, focus on uh, in this talk. Uh, the details of the algorithm is not necessarily, are not necessarily that important, right? I'm just putting here uh, for completeness. Uh, what uh, matters is that uh, uh, this is uh, one of those algorithms that use very little space, okay? So this algorithm is called a streaming algorithm, right? Which means that uh, uh, it operates by performing uh, uh, two passes, in this particular case, over your input matrix, right? Which the uh, matrix can be stored somewhere on disk, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, instead of storing this matrix in your uh, main memory, right, you only make passes over this matrix stored over the disk, and what you stored in your memory is only uh, the sketched version, right? So it requires the benefit of this algorithm that uses much less space uh, than an algorithm which would store the whole matrix in the main memory, okay? And basically, uh, the uh, efficiency of this algorithm is uh, strongly related to the number of uh, rows of this uh, sketch matrix S, right? Because uh, essentially the space it is using is uh, M times D plus N. D and N are the dimension of the original matrix, right? So in other words, the space uh, used by this algorithm is proportional to M, right? The, the number of rows in the sketch matrix. So the uh, uh, shorter we can get this matrix to be, uh, the more space efficient the algorithm is. Okay, and uh, the theoretical result shows that uh, uh, if you want to get k, uh, rank k approximation with the error epsilon, you can set m to be uh, this much, 
And the algorithm is uh, guaranteed uh, to give you, uh, you know, epsilon error uh, with uh, some uh, decent probability. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, theoretical guarantee uh, for uh, uh, this algorithm if the matrix A is not chosen to be random, right? Because past random matrix uh, does the job uh, here. All right, so the main question uh, in this uh, talk is, uh, uh, can we improve over this, right? So this is a theoretical bound. Uh, you know, can we, uh, but even in practice, you know, can we uh, achieve a better performance, uh, meaning can we live with smaller m, uh, if instead of uh, using a random matrix S, you know, we somehow train it uh, using the uh, input data, okay? And uh, so that's exactly the, the question that we uh, set to answer in our first work on this topic uh, in 2019. So the, the framework, and this is like the, the formal framework, right? I guess it was not the next slide, it was next few slides, right? But you know, hopefully after this slide it will be clear, right? Yeah. So the framework is that uh, we uh, sample, we assume that we have an access to uh, a bunch of uh, inputs to this problem, right? So this is not a setting, it's not a one-shot setting, right? That you are given a matrix, you compute something. It's a setting where uh, you are first given a collection of uh, matrices that come from the same distribution. And then you perform some computation, do some preprocessing, and you construct a very efficient low rank approximation algorithm that you can use uh, from now on. Okay? So uh, we take a bunch of our sample matrices, and uh, uh, you know, the only three parameters in uh, uh, those uh, low rank sketching based uh, uh, algorithms is the matrix S. Right, so we uh, learn uh, the matrix S by optimizing the empirical error, right? So this is the sum over all the training matrices of the uh, difference between the, uh, the actual matrix and uh, whatever the previous low rank approximation algorithm gives us, uh, given AI as an input and S as the sketching matrix, okay? So basically, we, we want to uh, uh, take S to minimize this uh, empirical error, right, respect to the prior uh, sample matrices, right, which we use to train uh, this uh, matrix uh, S. And once we uh, train it, then we use S in all the future uh, computation. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, essentially the, the basic uh, idea behind uh, the, 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 the approach. Of course, uh, you know, problems like that are always uh, more complicated, right, than uh, this uh, simple statement, okay? You know, there are lots of details. Uh, so some of the details that uh, we had to overcome in order to make this happen are as follows, right? So for starters, as I mentioned, we use a sparse matrices S, okay, which uh, basically look like this. They have uh, only one non-zero per column. And, uh, you know, it's relatively, easy to optimize over the values of those non-zeros, but uh, optimizing over locations, it's uh, much more difficult, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it becomes a combinatorial optimization problem, right? As opposed to uh, continuous, right? So, so basically, we kind of uh, uh, introduce a hack, meaning that uh, the locations are still random, right, as in the original uh, Salo SCW algorithm, but we optimize only the values, right? So it's like a partial optimization of, of this, right? We only optimize uh, conditioned on the non-zero entries of S being uh, fixed uh, as before. Uh, so that's one thing. Now, the other thing is that, uh, you know, as you can uh, imagine, you know, this is a pretty hard problem to optimize. It's highly non-convex, high dimensional, right? So we are not able to optimize it to, to uh, you know, exactly. Uh, instead, you know, we do what uh, people do uh, in deep learning literature, right? We just run uh, stochastic gradient descent, right? So we basically find some local uh, optimum uh, and uh, live with, uh, with that. Now, for this to happen, we need to be able to differentiate this loss with respect to the matrix S. And uh, in our original paper, uh, we didn't know how to differentiate uh, SGD, 
uh, in uh, in the system. So we basically we compile uh, SVD, uh, you know, like as a uh, sequence of. Uh, Basically, we implemented SVD as a power method, right? And then we don't have, we didn't have to, we only had to differentiate the matrix uh, vector multiplications, right? Which is already something that the system supports. I believe that now, uh, you know, SVD it can be differentiated directly uh, in the system. Yes? We found this correctly. You pick a random support for S and then you optimize for the values, but yes. there's another strategy where you put like a sparsity constraint on S in your optimization of the like loss function. Right. Do you have a reason why you pick one versus the other? Uh, well, we picked this one because uh, it was simpler uh, to start from. Uh, there is uh, another follow-up paper that I will mention earlier that uh, also optimizes over support. Uh, it does something different than you, what you suggested. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess the, the, so ma the main difficulty... Uh -huh. You're saying that basically picking a random support is not like affecting the ability to like, do the computation you want with S? Uh, well, so what it means is that uh, we might not be getting uh, S, which is as good as possible, uh, right? So potentially it could affect things by a lot, we just don't know, because we never find, found the, the, the optimum, right? Uh, right, so you, you are thinking about uh, uh, putting like a zero constraint or a one constraint? Adding like lambda S and norm one, for instance. Uh, norm one, yeah, so we didn't try it. It's a, it's a, it's a very interesting idea. Yeah, we, it's, it's also a natural idea. I guess we, we, in this paper, we just wanted to start from something, right? Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good point that uh, we could just uh, add L1 immunization, right? And, and uh, you know, hope that in this setting, it will also reduce the sparsity, right? Uh, there was a question or, no? All right. All right, so, uh, Right, and, and basically, this, uh, and this uh, we are using uh, gradient descent. We have to start from somewhere, so we just uh, use random matrix as a starting point, right? And just uh, do a gradient descent, you know, to minimize this uh, empirical error. So, of course, the, the main question here is empirical. You know, does this work? Uh, and to answer this question, you know, we have to focus on a particular class of uh, matrices. Uh, and it's important, you know, uh, this word class is important. Right, because uh, to train, we have to have several matrices that kind of uh, come from the same distribution. Right, so, so we cannot use many of the matrix uh, dataset repositories because they contain a single matrix. Right, so you know, we cannot really learn anything from that. Uh, so what we looked at is a you know, collection of uh, datasets where indeed you, know, you have a collection of uh, similar matrices. Uh, one of them is videos. Right, so each uh, frame is a matrix, right? So you can take any video, for example, video of like a MIT logo being drawn or, or some other examples. And this gives you, you know, like frames are natural matrices, which are of course related. Uh, Hyperspectral images are another source, right? Because you have, you know, matrices which are again related uh, uh, on different frequencies. And uh, this is an example that I use as a, a matrix representation of documents. Right, and these are uh, documents uh, coming from the similar source. And that we, uh, you know, uh, use a training set and a testing set, right, to separate from, from training. And uh, we optimize the matrix S, as uh, described earlier, using testing matrices. And, uh, and then we compute the recovery error over the test matrices. Right, so this is uh, the recovery error over test, is uh, what we uh, report on the uh, next slide. And what we, what we care about, again, is the difference, right, between, uh, you know, the, the error induced by the best case uh, uh, k-component approximation and uh, what our algorithm reports. Right, so this is this uh, extra error, right, that uh, we are inducing by using this approximate algorithm. Uh, and we compare it to what happens, we just use uh, random matrices, right, as in the classical algorithm. Uh, so we did it, and uh, to our uh, pleasant surprise, uh, it turns out that uh, at least for the data sets that we uh, try things on, uh, you can indeed get a lot of mileage by optimizing those uh, values of uh, non-zero uh, non entries in the matrix uh, S, okay? So uh, the plot that you see here is a test error, right, as described in the earlier slide, as a function of 
m, right, which is the number of rows in the sketching matrix. So of course, the more uh, information you sketch, you know, the, the lower the error is. But you can see that uh, there is a quite significant gap uh, between uh, the random matrices and the train matrices, mm -hmm. right? And this is uh, exponential, it's a logarithmic scale, right? So, uh, you know, here the difference is maybe not significant. Here it's uh, actually like up to order of magnitude, right? And similarly uh, here. So basically what this uh, shows is that uh, indeed, if you optimize, uh, if you learn that uh, matrix as opposed to using uh, random matrix, you can actually reduce the error uh, for the same uh, number of rows quite uh, significantly. So this is uh, perhaps the main finding uh, of the paper. Now, of course, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, once you start using the uh, optimized matrices, you lose guarantees, right, that you might have had earlier when you use random uh, matrices. Uh, so what can you do? Well, it turns out that uh, in, in case of this algorithm, there is a very simple uh, fallback option, uh, which is that uh, you can combine this uh, learn matrix with uh, uh, some extra random rows. Okay, you can literally stack them on top of each other. It doesn't work for all uh, algorithms, but uh, it does work for uh, this uh, SCW uh, algorithm. It requires, you know, like a few line proof. Uh, essentially, uh, what you can show is that uh, uh, adding this uh, random R uh, on top of matrix S cannot decrease the error. Uh, and uh, at the same time, and you know, conversely, it means that uh, adding this uh, S on top of R also cannot decrease the error, right? Which means that uh, we retain the guarantees, uh, whatever guarantees the sum matrix R here gives us, while potentially improving things by a lot because uh, we are also using the learn component, okay? So here is, a, uh, is an example of how it works. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, for different data sets, you know, and different parameters of K and M, you know, here are the uh, empirical errors of the purely learned matrix, purely random matrix, and the mixed. Mixed means it's like 50-50, right? So it's the, the total matrix still has the same length, uh, the height, 20, but uh, here we, uh, one half of it is learned, the other half is random. Right, and you can see that, uh, uh, you know, of course, mixed doesn't give you the same empirical error as purely learned, right, because you are learning fewer errors. Uh, but still, it's uh, pretty good, right? Most of the times, it's actually closer to the learned than to random. And uh, at the same time, you retain the guarantees, whatever this uh, random component gives you, right? Because uh, you can just directly translate it into guarantees of this algorithm. Right? So, so in a way, you know, this could be viewed uh, as uh, the best, best of both worlds uh, scenario, right? That you are learning and, uh, you know, you are doing better, but you also retain some, some guarantees. Um, question. Yes? When you do the mixed case, do you learn the features with those random uh, settings, or do you first learn the first 10 and then just concatenate random? I guess it's the learn condition to the randomness of the second half. Right. So if I remember correctly, uh, we uh, uh, learned it jointly with the random component. It's just that component is not modified uh, in the learning process. Yeah. Uh, I think what I said is true uh, with like 90% probability. <laughs> uh, right? I will have to double check too. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, so let's see. I have like... 10 or 15, uh, 15 minutes left? Yeah, 15. 15? All right, okay. All right, so, uh, so that's basically uh, was something that we did in uh, 2019. Uh, in particular, you know, like the bottom lines that we showed the sketches can indeed improve the uh, accuracy measurement trade-off for a low rank approximation, like similar to the earlier work uh, on compressed sensing. And we also show that you can retain some guarantees by you know, mixing random and learned rows, right? So, so that's nice. Uh, now that said, you know, uh, this algorithm still has lots of issues. Uh, one issue is that the training time, which is you know, optimizing this uh, non-convex objective function, uh, is really long, right? It uh, took us uh, hours on GPU to, to train the uh, matrix, which, you know, it's probably okay if you are gonna use this matrix for the next year, right? But uh, if you want to use it for the next, like every five minutes, you know, you want to change it, then, then just not gonna fly, right? 
So that's one issue. Uh, the other uh, issues are more theoretical, which is uh, it would be nice to have some guarantees that uh, if, we, uh, if our uh, data set is large enough, we actually uh, can, in principle, uh, find this uh, optimal matrix S up to some error. Right? Like right now, we just have no clue. Right? We're just putting uh, as many matrices as our data set has and hope for the best, but we have no theoretical guarantees. Like how many matrices we actually need right, to, uh, to get the optimal uh, sketch matrix S. So that's uh, one question or another question. And, uh, you know, and last but not least, you know, our, we are using a stochastic gradient descent to, uh, to minimize this function, right? We are stuck at local minimum. We have no idea how far this local minimum is from the global minimum, right? Uh, so uh, getting some algorithm which probably minimizes the loss function up to a constant factor would be uh, super interesting, right? Especially if it can avoid, you know, this uh, gradient descent, you know, if, if maybe there's some more direct way of, uh, of doing it. Uh, so these are the, the, th the problems that we are thinking over the last three years. Uh, we still don't have an answer to this one, uh, but uh, we do have uh, some progress on the training time and uh, on the sampling complexity. Okay, so uh, this is what I will briefly cover in the uh, next uh, 10 minutes uh, or so. All right, so uh, after our work uh, in 2019, there have been uh, a few uh, very, very cool uh, follow-ups. Uh, most of these uh, follow-ups focus on a different uh, training method or, or training different type of matrices. Okay, in particular, uh, this work is uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, essentially, you know, in our case, we learned a uh, random sparse matrix, or, or we optimize over random sparse matrix. Uh, this paper, uh, trains uh, random partial Fourier-like matrix, right? So what it means, uh, you know, Fourier matrices are basically a product of uh, sparse matrices, right? Uh, so uh, with a you know particular value with particular values, right? You know the roots of unity and and so on. Uh, so this algorithm retains the structure of those matrices, but again uh, learns the values, right? Instead of uh, just keeping them fixed. And uh, as well, showing the, on the next slide, you know, it's, uh, uh, you, know, in, you know, because of this uh, different type of a sketching uh, matrix that uh, this method learns, you know, they, they are getting, uh, in a variety of ways, much better uh, algorithm empirically. And there has been also work on learning locations. Uh, and uh, uh, we had a paper last year which shows a faster algorithm, which doesn't go through all this uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it's more, uh, it's more like a one shot or few shot learning. You know that you sample a few things, and based on those few matrices that you sample, you construct the sketching matrix, right? So it's not as good uh, as this one, but uh, it's much faster. So uh, these methods here improve essentially the the training time. Uh, this method, this paper here, which uh, uh, just came out this year, uh, for the first time shows uh, uh, lower. Oops, actually it should be both upper and lower bound on the sampling complexity uh, of this problem, right? So we're able for the first time to show uh, how many matrices you need uh, in order to get some uh, guarantees, right? That you are close to the optimal sketching matrix. All right, so uh, let me briefly uh, summarize the work on improving the training time. Uh, so what you see here is an example uh, of this uh, training process on a logo data set. So this is one of those uh, video uh, data sets. Uh, this is an uh, uh, improvement, like as a function of time, of the error uh, uh, in our method from 2019. Uh, the butterfly method, right, uh, which I just described on the previous slide, uh, is this... Uh, uh, black curve, and you can see that uh, it's way, way faster uh, than it converges or, you know, achieves a near optimum much faster than the previous method, right? I mean, this method, you know, this is not the optimum, it just continues, it's just, uh, but very slowly, right? Because it reaches the optimum, uh, this method jumps to optimum uh, much faster. And we also had the, uh, the, the, the few-shot method uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier, 
uh, it's not as good uh, as the, the optimum, right? The, the few shot are, the, are depicted as red, uh, green, and blue dots here. Okay, they don't improve over time, but uh, they are fast, very fast as starting points. Right, so what you can do is uh, uh, you can t take those as initialization and then uh, you know, run a gradient descent on them and then you get also very efficient, uh, very fast improvement. Okay, so this is uh, you know, just an example showing that uh, you know, thanks to these uh, uh, new methods, you can actually train this thing uh, much faster. I, I would say that part of it is just a better implementation of the training process in, in uh, PyTorch, right? Like to some extent, we weren't quite, we didn't quite know what we are doing when we uh, wrote this paper, right? So, so it's both a better implementation, but it's also, you know, like using different algorithms and different matrices. Yes. For the training, so are you using GPU or just using the CPU? Uh, Okay, so this particular, okay, I believe this plot is uh, done on GPU, yeah. Just one GPU card? Uh, uh, on a machine with uh, multiple GPUs. Yeah, I don't remember exactly the architecture. Uh, it should be, this plot is taken from this paper, right? So in that paper we describe the, the, the yeah, the, the, yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. this, this method was very slow without GPUs, so. Uh. All right, so that's the faster training. Now, in terms of what about the sampling complexity, right, trying to get uh, the, uh, you know, some, some bounds, uh, how many uh, matrices are necessary and sufficient to, uh, uh, you know, to find near optimal sketch matrix S, so to this end, we, uh, we use uh, a framework due to Gupta and Ayer of Garden, uh, who essentially view this uh, problem of uh, learning algorithms as a statistical learning problem, right? And uh, uh, essentially, once you put your problem in this framework, then you know it's a statistical learning problem. So you, uh, you know, you, it, it suffices to prove uh, bounds on you know VC dimension or some like real uh, analogs like fat shattering dimension of uh, you know this class of algorithms and it gives you uh, basically statistical guarantees right that you need uh, uh, that many samples or, or that many samples are sufficient to uh, find near optimal matrix S. So in this paper we are applying this framework to, to uh, you know, basically the numerical uh, linear algebra algorithms for low rank approximation, as I described earlier. Now, I don't think I would be able to, uh, I have like five minutes left, right? I don't think I would be able to describe uh, this whole uh, framework, uh, but uh, let me just uh, give uh, maybe a snapshot. Uh, so the basic idea, you know, is to view this algorithm as a uh, loss minimization problem. Right, so the inputs, you know, come from some family X, and the algorithms are basically, you know, the algorithms uh, are denoted by L, uh, subfield rho, and this uh, rho is the parameter of this algorithm, right? And uh, uh, basically, we think about this uh, algorithm as a loss, right? That if we run algorithm on a particular input, then we have this much error. Right, and then our goal is to, uh, you know, optimize the subparameter rho with respect to some distribution, right, over the uh, inputs x. Yeah, so in our case, you know, uh, x is the set of matrices, uh, L, you know, are the, are the losses incurred by the algorithm, which use uh, matrix, sketching matrix S as a parameter, and uh, uh, this is our loss. Right, is the difference between the truth and the uh, whatever our algorithm reports, uh, right, when uh, applied on matrix A using sketching matrix S. And then there is, you know, and now we can just uh, plug it in standard uh, learning uh, uh, theory framework, right? You can start computing uh, things like VC dimension, fat shattering dimension. So I'm going to skip uh, all of it. Uh, but just let me state the, uh, the, our final result. So basically we give uh, both upper and lower bound on the uh, so-called uh, fast shattering dimension of uh, this uh, learning process, right? And uh, we have the upper bound, we have the lower bound. And uh, you can see that uh, the upper bound 
uh, and the lower bound uh, differ by essentially a factor of, of n, right? So they are not optimal. Uh, at least we don't know which one is the optimal, right? They are not tied, uh, but uh, they are uh, actually pretty close, uh, right? So we have at least some sense of uh, what this uh, uh, learning parameter uh, of this process is. And once we have this uh, fast learning dimension, uh, we can then uh, uh, plug it into classic complexity theoric uh, results, you know, which basically shows that uh, the number of samples is uh, proportional to the fat shattering dimension. Right? So uh, by plugging this bound, right, we get the uh, bounds on the sampling complexity of the process. Uh, I won't have time to get into how we do it. I just mentioned that uh, you know, we're stuck on uh, trying to get those guarantees for, for a few years until uh, uh, Peter Bartlett, who's the co-author on this paper, uh, mentioned to us the uh, seminal paper by Goldberg and Jerome, uh, who essentially came, uh, came up with a very general framework for computing you know, VC dimensions or uh, fat shedding dimensions of uh, uh, programs which use only arithmetic and if statements. Okay, so this framework was, uh, uh, using this framework was pretty crucial to obtain what we uh, wanted to do because, uh, you know, linear algebraic computations exactly fall into, uh, into this uh, uh, setting, right? You only use arithmetic operation and you have some if statements here and there. Right? We, we tried to use a combinatorial approach and it just didn't work uh, until we, we, we found this paper. Now, if you apply this uh, method naively, you are not going to get very good bounds. Uh, so, uh, so basically, we look a little bit more, you know, we don't treat it as a black box, we treat it as a white box, right? We try to refine the complexity uh, uh, measures that, uh, that they are uh, using. And then we essentially de uh, design approximation, we implement this SCW uh, within this framework. Uh, uh, you know, essentially we implement this orthogonal projection and best rank approximation in this uh, framework, uh, which uh, then lets us to get this uh, not tight, but uh, reasonably close uh, upper and lower points. All right, so that's, uh, uh, that's uh, in conclusion, right? What we have seen is, uh, is this. Uh, perhaps the main open problem is, uh, can we somehow minimize the loss function uh, provably? Right, so that could mean two things: either uh, giving guarantees on this uh, SGD uh, on this uh, gradient descent, or maybe come up with some more direct direct way to uh, to find the uh, matrix S, right, without going through all this uh, uh, minimization. Right, so that that would be a, you know having any insight here would be would be very uh, very interesting, and this potentially could you know improve the training time even more, right, especially if you don't have to go through gradient descent, right, you have some you know, explicit formula, right? That uh, just calculates this uh, good sketching matrix based on the uh, input matrices. And last but not least, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a one line of research in a broader area of uh, so-called uh, learning based algorithms. Uh, and most of the algorithms in this space are uh, combinatorial, but, uh, uh, you know, like some of them are also uh, numerical, uh, right? So in particular, uh, I talked about one of the examples, right? So a year ago, we had a, a workshop uh, organized by Foundation of Data Science Institute. Uh, uh, with uh, who, uh, speakers, you know, gave a broad overview of uh, uh, research in this uh, area. And for course, Alex Dimakis, Yonina Eldar, and uh, uh, Rein, Rein, Reinhard, Reinhard right, uh, talked about uh, learning augmented uh, uh, numerical uh, algorithm, right? So, uh, so if you are interested in learning more, uh, you know, the talks are available uh, here, right? So uh, they, are, they are on YouTube. And uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. <laughs>